Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Welcome back to the Functional Forum. <laughs> We're excited to have everyone here again live at the Helen Mills Center in Manhattan, New York. Uh, the Functional Forum, our intention is to accelerate the evolution of medicine, and we do that pr by providing a monthly platform for the cutting edge of healthcare information, as well as to provide uh, a view into the, the merging of the technology and functional medicine world. Uh, we want to bring together doctors, thinkers, communicators, innovators, uh, people who care about the future of health in this world into one space so together we can co-create the future. Um, recently this week, I was actually looking through one of our uh, big supporters, Green Med Info's website, and saw an article about uh, the latest testing on HPV and how uh, the most recent uh, GlaxoSmithKline study actually showed that the HPV virus is maybe preventing women from getting cervical cancer rather than being the cause of it. You know, I bring this up because information is changing so quickly. And what, we, what we're looking to do is create a space where we can come together and get better at sharing it, teaching it, and using it. And you can just see how fast this is happening. Month to month, there, there's new stuff coming out. We're excited to present it to you each time. You know, when, when we started to put together these events, and if you've ever put together events before, you start to realize how important sponsors are. You know, the sponsors are really what makes it possible for us to do this and to bring it to everyone here. And it's very important for the people we work with, that the Functional Forum works with, that the sponsors are in alignment with what we do, and we take that very seriously. So just wanted to take a couple mo moments to appreciate some of them. Uh, Designs for Health has been a sponsor from the very beginning. Uh, they helped us get started. Incredible nutraceutical company, uh, excellent formulas. Also, they provide the protein bars uh, out in the hallway, which I eat about four of each event, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, Energetics, of course, another sponsor you guys may see, uh, the water bottles and the energetic drops that we have outside. Sometimes we call that placebo juice. That's what James likes to call it. And uh, we mean that in a good way. If you've been here before, placebo is, is positive. Um, Let's see. Oh, AMG, incredible skincare line in the back. Uh, they, you know, in terms of skincare lines, to have a natural and clean one is, is obviously preferred. Most of the natural lines are not actually that clean. And they're also, they, they bring a party with them, so they're a lot of fun to hang out with. So they do everything very seriously. They set up on time, they party on time, so we're happy to have them here. Uh, N1 Health, N1 Health is a very innovative company. Um, creating a business model that's connecting patients and doctors in a new, uh, in a new way. And they, they've been so helpful. I mean, they're actually sponsoring many of the doctors who are in attendance today. They're so passionate about bringing people together and exposing them to this information. Uh, so we're, we're just really appreciative of these guys to, to support us and help us bring this, bring this to you. Now, as always, we're being streamed live tonight around the country, which is very exciting. Uh, for those of you who are watching the live stream, We'd love for you to participate. Uh, and the way you would participate and ask questions and share with us is by, uh, with the hashtag, tweeting us hashtag functional forum. And if you do that, we will look to get, get you guys involved. And you know, this is all about engaging the, the audience and engaging the people out there watching through the internet and through the stream. Of course, we have stream partners who make the stream possible. Hello Health is a company that provides uh, software solutions to doctors to create more efficient practices as well as neuroscience, and neuroscience is a company that's providing neuroendocrine testing uh, for patients and doctors, and, and everything is very cutting edge. Uh, companies that are bringing together technology as well as health and, and things that we're proud to deliver. So, you know, we definitely encourage everyone to check out these companies, and, you know, they're obviously part of why we're able to, to put this show on. A couple other things. Uh, we, we've already had uh, three great events. We've had amazing speakers. For those of you who are at home or those of you who are here, if you want to see the archives, you can go to our website, functionalforum.com. You can like us on Facebook, uh, Functional Forum on Facebook, and also you can go to our YouTube channel, Functional Forum. And we're putting the information out there. We're using the media. We're looking to share all the amazing ideas that come up here so that people can learn from them and so we can uh, keep moving this whole thing forward. Okay, with that being said, let's move to tonight's event, 
The topic is the evolution of medicine. Our tagline has been accelerating the evolution of medicine. So obviously we're very excited about tonight. We have some incredible speakers and people we're very excited to bring up. Without further ado, here's your host, my brother from a taller mother, James <laughs> Maskell. All right. All right. Epic turnout. And we're getting a bit better. It's getting a bit organized. You feel a bit more organized this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm glad that almost everyone has a seat. I was scared that we were going to actually have standing room only. But you know what? I don't know if you've heard this, but the Surgeon General tells us that uh, sitting is the new smoking. So <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome at the back if you haven't got a seat. So uh, it's great to be here. Look, we've had an amazing lineup three times in a row, like Gabe said. And today, we're really taking on the big one, the future of medicine. Everyone wants to know what it is, what it's going to look like. And what our intention is tonight is to bring you not only to, to share with you what we see as the future of medicine, and also not just what we see, but we're going to bring you the data. And why is the data important? It's because the data is the future of medicine. You know, think about this, all the physicians out there. Someone comes in and you take their blood pressure reading. That's one piece of blood pressure. That's one reading, one time in the week. Maybe you have, your blood pressure goes up when you go into a doctor's office, right? This is a problem. This is just a one-time information. So when the technological revolution comes and everyone's wearing an eye watch where you can measure your uh, blood pressure every second of every day, that's going to give you a lot more data and it's going to help you to get more accurate diagnosis and see what's going on. So data, that's just one example of how big data is going to change medicine. And so rather than, you know, my favorite thing to do is to stand here and pontificate about what's going to happen. If you've been here before, you know that that's what I like to do. And if you're here, maybe you like it because you're, you came back. But, um, but I'm not going to do that tonight. What I'm actually going to do is just give you the data in, the, in, the, uh, in, in line with what's going to happen. So there's not that many people who are collecting data on what physicians are doing. It's, a, it's not like physicians and functional medicine is not a big data set. There's not a lot of people that are creating it. However, the people that are getting it and have the most, the most relevant and the most, um, you know, the most powerful information happen to be good friends of mine. And I really want to honor them tonight because they've really made a lot of this happening, uh, a lot of this happen. Uh, Jeff Glad, who's going to be speaking later. Jeff and I know each other because he's the conference chairman for Heal Thy Practice. And Heal Thy Practice is an awesome conference. It's coming up uh, September, I mean, October 17th to 20th in New York. But it's all about the non-clinical aspects of building a strong, sustainable practice, moving from regular medicine to functional medicine. They got some great speakers this year. But the people who put that on is Eric and Meg from Holistic primary care. You guys have the magazines here. And as well as putting on awesome conferences and making a publication, they're also getting the newest data on what's going on. What are doctors doing? How many of them are doing supplements in their office? How many of them are going cash pay? What are the attitudes? So without further ado, let's just introduce Eric, and he can actually give you the data of what's going on so we don't have to guess and you don't have to see so much pontification. So first up, here he is, Eric Goldman. He's been with us. Wow, well, this is this is wonderful. The, the, the energy in this room is just terrific. So I want to thank James for putting this all together, and thank you all for coming out on this beautiful spring evening. And for those of you out in Streamland, hello and welcome to New York. We've got a, a great program, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to share some numbers. Um, but before I do that, I want to I want to roll back the time machine to February uh, at the first functional forum, James opened by saying something that's really stuck with me over the last uh, few months. He said something along the lines of, we've got to start acting like we're winning because we are winning. And by us, he meant the people that are interested in holistic medicine and functional medicine and this, this whole transformation of healthcare. So some of the numbers that I'm going to show you tonight, I think are really going to corroborate that, that we really actually are winning and the tides are turning in our favor. So let me jump on into this. Um, as you know, we, we do holistic primary care. We've been pr producing this publication for 14 years, and we've been kind of chronicling the transition that's going on, the awesome transition that's going on in American medicine. Um, 
And like James said, the Heal I Practice Conference, that's coming up in October, October 17th to the 19th, up right here in Westchester, so close to home. If you're looking for making a transition in your practice or you want to connect up with other like-minded people, uh, please come on out for that. So how did we get in the data game? Uh, we got in the data game because our advertisers, some of our advertisers, were asking very obvious questions like, how many doctors sell supplements? How many doctors recommend supplements? What are the top most recommended categories of supplements? Things that were like, yeah, pretty obvious that a, a business would want to know, but nobody really seemed to have the answers. So we thought, well, we could do ourselves a service and a uh, service for our, our advertiser base by actually looking at that. So we got into doing uh, practitioner surveys. And the first one was in, in uh, 2010. And we did one in 2013 and again in 2014. So basically what we did was we sent a 31-question survey uh, to about 1,000 primary care clinicians, mostly conventionally trained MDs and DOs, so it is a generally conventionally trained crowd. Uh, on the print side of things, we got an 8% response rate, which if you've ever done direct mail with physicians, you know that's really quite good. Um, email questionnaire we sent out to, you know, everybody's busy. It's hard to get people to take 20 minutes to respond to a survey. Uh, uh, we did uh, eight, a little over 8,000 clinicians on email, plus an additional list of 3,300 nurses, because we, we got really interested in the nurses. So we have a nice database to, to work with. Uh, in aggregate, we've got 643 respondents, uh, 549 doctors, and 94 nurses. And uh, in terms of basic demographics, it split a m much higher proportion of women this year. I think that has to do with the inclusion of the nurses, who are almost all women. So it was about 65 to 35 women to men. Mean age was 52. And median household income is 150K. And about 34%, about a third of them, are strictly insurance-based. Uh, and then we saw a lot of people that are doing mixed practices as well. We'll get into that uh, in a second. So that's what the pie chart looks like, 66% uh, MDs, 11% uh, DOs. So combined, we had about uh, uh, almost 80% was uh, conventionally trained physicians. OK, owner versus employee. This is important um, because we've seen a big transition in healthcare uh, from private practice to uh, employment models. A lot more physicians and nurses and other healthcare professionals are going, uh, they're becoming employees. But in our sampling, uh, about 42% were owners and 8% were partners. So about 50% are in some way in control of their own practices. 39% are employees in some way. Um, in terms of insurance-based versus non-insurance-based, interesting shift away from insurance-based medicine. Uh, in 2013, which is the big bright blue bars, 52% said they were insurance-based. That's down to 34%. Uh, and that was uh, met by a corresponding shift from uh, into direct pay. So uh, in 2013, 17% were doing direct pay, and now it's up to 28%. So big shift toward direct pay. Concierge, not so much. I think that model still hasn't really totally caught on, but direct pay certainly has. And then you've got about one-fifth are doing um, mixed practices. So they're taking insurance on some days and not taking insurance on other days. They're, so to speak, holistic days. 47% um, are considering a big change in their practice model in the coming years. That's up from 33% saying that in 2013. And direct pay is the big one. They're looking at shifting out of insurance and going into more of a direct pay model. Uh, the other interesting trend is group visits. Uh, that's very popular with family physicians. Uh, the idea of aggregating a number of, pr of patients who have the same health issue and meeting with them and doing a group visit. Very popular model. A lot of people are exploring that. So engagement with holistic medicine. 94% say they're doing something that falls into the bailiwick of holistic medicine. I'm getting the, the one minute mark, so I better move fast. OK, Jeff Blanspeed here. Um, the most common things are uh, uh, stress management. Functional medicine is becoming a very popular term. Botanical medicine is on the rise. Um, you see here, uh, this, this bar here is the uh, general cohort, the one above it is the MDs. 86% of the MDs are saying they're doing something to do with nutrition. Now, how deep that goes, we don't know. It's probably fairly surface for a lot of them, but still, they're discussing nutrition in a way that they hadn't uh, probably about 10 years ago. Um, I guess we can leap over that one and look at 91% uh, of them are recommending supplements. That's including 95% of the MDs. So a lot of supplement recommendations going on. It's obvious stuff. It's probiotics, minerals, essential fatty acids, multivitamins, and letter vitamins. Those are the top five. Nothing too esoteric, but again, this is stuff that MDs and uh, conventionally trained nurses were not doing 10 or 15 years ago. Um, willingness to recommend was not affected by practitioner age or by insurance status, which I thought was very interesting. Um, 38% are dispensing in their offices. That's up from 34% in 2000, 
thir uh, 13, and 36% of the MDs, so the MDs tracking very closely with the general cohort. Um, a lot more people dispensing, it's because they're looking for revenue, and dispensing is a really good way of meeting a patient need and creating revenue for the practices. Uh, when we ask those who don't dispense, why don't they dispense, 36% say it's because the employer or administrator that they work for won't let them. What that tells me is that if we're going to take things to the next, next level, we've got to really start working at the systems level. So the hospital systems, the major uh, uh, managed care networks, the people that own the practices, that's where the shift has to happen next. The ethical objection, um, some people still have it, but still it's only 20% are saying that they're not dispensing because of uh, ethics. Um, nursing attitudes towards uh, nutrition and supplements. Uh, basically, 100% of these nurses agree that dietary changes and nutritional interventions are a fundamental part of the care of patients with chronic diseases. Uh, as far as supplement engagement, 46% um, strongly agree with the statement that, and this is interesting, Diseases can be treated or ameliorated with supplements and natural products. It's exactly what supplement companies are not allowed to claim, but nurses are getting that message. And um, they're, uh, we don't know how deeply engaged they are as far as dispensing and all, but they are certainly philosophically engaged. They believe in the healing effects of supplements or natural products, but they have concerns about the quality and safety. So there are still some, some concerns that need to be addressed, but by and large, the nurses are quite on board. So basically what I want you to take home is the fact that there's been a big shift, a lot more practitioners engaged in holistic medicine. The numbers who are seeking new revenue are, is definitely increasing over the last couple of years. Um, increased engagement with all different holistic modalities. Growth of functional medicine, half these practitioners identify as functional. Now whether that would, what they do is gonna pass muster with you know, Jeff Bland and Mark Hyman and the uh, Institute for Functional Medicine crowd, I don't know. But the point is the term is definitely um, very much in, in currency right now, and a lot of uh, physicians and nurses are identifying with it. And then the other thing that I thought was interesting was a big growth in botanical medicine, which has sort of been like the Detroit of the whole um, natural medicine world. You know, it got so marginalized and outcast that it only had up to go, right? So 44% so say they're using herbs in their practices, up from 23% in 2013. So again, all very positive changes. I think um, this should all be very hopeful messages to you. If you want the slides, uh, just let me know, and um, I'll be happy to email them to you. And with that, I'll kick it back over to James. All right. Woo. Thanks, Eric. Good stuff, my man. Appreciate it. Yeah, Eric, if you guys, uh, I, I hope you take a look at the conference in, uh, in October because it's, they got some great speakers and I'm sure Eric would be happy to speak more about it. So look, proof, we're winning. That was the proof, you just saw it. So he mentioned one quote and that, is, that has been a quote and if you look at the next three doctors that I'm going to bring up, they are living by that quote. We've got to stop acting like we're losing and start acting like we're winning. But there's a couple of other quotes that I want to share with you that I think they also live by, particularly this next doctor, Dr. Jeff Glad. Peter Drucker said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And Jeff Glad is creating it. So you may be sitting this and saying, you know, this is fine and this is good and I'm glad that doctors are doing it, but there is a sort of a perception out there that this is rich people medicine. The only rich people can afford this, and yes, it's fine to do it in New York and LA, but how are we gonna reach Kansas and Indiana and all the other places that need to get functional medicine? And that's why right from the beginning, Almost when I started booking this out, I was like, I had to get Jeff Glad to come in and speak. So Jeff and I have known each other from Heal Thy Practice for a few years. Um, you're going to meet his alter ego, Fat Jeff. I'm sure he'll tell you um, about Fat Jeff, but uh, he's a, a distant friend, um, you know, long, long forgotten. Uh, but Jeff is a great guy. The very first thing, who was here on the very first functional forum? The, do you remember the first thing we did on the first day, the first functional forum was Might Have Been. Mitovin was the mitovin.com. It's where you, you can put in all of the drugs. It's an online platform. You put in all the drugs and it tells you uh, the nutrient deficiencies associated with those drugs and the symptoms associated with those nutrient deficiencies. It's online now. It has all the PubMed studies. Jeff created it. This is an innovator in health technology and what you'll see today is by using technology and using a lot of cool other strategies, he's been able to bring cash pay, direct pay, functional medicine to one of the poorest and stupidest zip codes in the country. So here he is, Dr. Jeff Glad. <laughs> Look, if you had one shot, one opportunity, to seize everything you ever wanted.
That's quite an intro. That's good. We popping up here? There we go. All right. So when I say integrative, if you want to read that as functional or holistic, we're all in the same family. I think there are a lot more similarities than there are differences, and that's what we should be building toward and working together on. So how do we do this? How do we take Eric's data, get inspired by it, and then go out and do this ourselves and help bring this to the masses? And that's what I call integrative medicine 2.0. So you know, 1.0 is the content and going to learn it. 2.0 is spreading that message and, and going out and actually practicing it. Um, so there's Fat Jeff. That was eight years ago. Um, not only was I physically unhealthy, but, but I would say from a career and professional standpoint, I was pretty unhealthy as well. Uh, Overstressed, 30, 40 patients a day, primary care doctor. Um, and actually my first uh, job, my first contract out of residency, I, I never worked a day in that practice because I remember being in the physician meeting three months before I was supposed to start, hospital administration came in and said, here's your packets, doc. What are these? Well, this is your new compensation formula. We're switching from paying you based on your production to based on what we collect off of that. Watch these guys look at one third of their salary just disappear. Um, so I left and I went and started a solo practice uh, in Northeast Indiana um, and, and got into the grind there the pain of, of, of billing insurance and trying to see 30, 40 patients a day uh, w was burdensome. So I did something about that first personally, uh, found nutrition, only had 15 minutes in my seven years of training, so I had to figure that out myself, um, lost 50 pounds, and then took off and, and learned integrative medicine, uh, was inspired to change the way I practiced that, refused to keep practicing the way I was already doing it, um, and so I decided to make that change and, and just kept going. In doing that, ha have been involved in lots of cool things uh, as a demonstration of what's possible if you get, you know, you've got passion, you've got a story, and, and you want to get involved in some cool stuff. So started a couple dot coms. One of them was sold to the Discovery Channel. Um, been involved in a couple different clinics and, and, and working with a, a really cool technology platform we'll talk about as well. So why does this holistic, integrative, functional care work? It, it works because we're actually sitting down with patients and spending time with them. We're teaching them, right? Doctor is Latin for teach or to teach. And, and so we're finally meeting with patients, and, and they're finally sitting with a provider who, who understands them or at least empathizes with their story. Um, and we're empowering them. We're giving them the tools to take their health to the next level or, or bring it back to where they wanted it to be in the first place. Um, it's connection. It's dealing with the root issues. Um, and really what this all boils down to is it's about relationships. We're creating relationships with patients unlike any other relationship that they've had in the healthcare system. And so my experience is most conventional practice relationships are based on efficiency. How fast can I get us to a diagnosis and a prescription so I can jump to the next room because I got five other people waiting for me? On the other hand, integrative practice relationships are actually about relationships and cultivating those relationships. So if you go back and you think about your, your most cultivated relationships, whether they're family members or close friends or a spouse, those things take a lot of time and they take a lot of connectivity, face-to-face -face connectivity, but I texted my wife all day on my travels. Uh, we'll FaceTime my kids in the morning. Staying connected is really important for building relationships. And we need to realize that as we build these necessary relationships with our patients. Unfortunately, we don't have really good reimbursable CPT codes to cover that. And that's the problem. And I know that because my hospital employed version of this practice, I started an integrated practice with the local hospital. We build insurance. I saw patients for an hour, and two years in, they came down and they said, we love what you do. You've got incredible patient satisfaction scores. You've got incredible patient success stories. We just need you to see three times as many people. In addition, I was spending an awful lot of time trying to use email and, and phone consultation and trying to use technology to connect with patients all on my time, not reimbursable. So I decided to spin this off, and I decided to do my own thing. And I thought about, who do I really work for here? Who do I represent in that patient visit? 
I represent the healthcare system, the hospital, work for the insurance company. Who do I want to work for? I want to work for the patient. So I decided to spin off and start my own practice and work in a direct pay model where I get to spend as much time with that patient as they want or they need. And I get to create that relationship and I get to build that relationship and I don't have any other outside forces because I, I work for the patient. Um, I have two nurse practitioners, uh, one of which is my wife. Uh, I have a dietitian and I have a health coach in this practice and this is, uh, will be four years in August. Um, I have a practice platform that helps me engage and connect to the patients in the way that I want to and I'm completely off the grid. I don't have any insurance contracts with Medicare, Medicaid or any private insurers. <laughs> Thanks. So as I tried to figure this out and tried to build this model and envision this model, I, I wanted to fig figure out how to build these relationships. And I thought, you know what, ever since I graduated medical school, I have been essentially the virtual primary care doctor for all of my friends and family. Right? It's an email, not as much text back then, but it would be text now. Hey, what do I do? Hey, here's Bobby's rash. What do you think? Keeping them out of the ER, send them to the urgent care, or just tell them to sleep on it, it's going to get okay. Why can't I have that same relationship with patients and actually have a business model that supports that so that I can, you know, be with my family and support my family and, and, and we can all win? So I found Hello Health. Um, and, and there's some, you know, some very important people from Hello Health here hanging out with us. But this is the platform that I found that does that for me. So I use email communication in my practice. The beautiful part is it doesn't come to my email inbox. I log into Hello Health and get the secure inbox. So I'm not bothered by it when I'm not in the practice and when I'm not, you know, and on the weekend, my patients know that I won't see that email until Monday morning. Um, we do video consultations. Again, all secure within the platform. Um, and it's an open sharing of data. We share the library um, so that they can see their files. I think we're going to give you a better mic. Can you rock it like this? Yeah. Okay. Do I stand away from the mic like this? Okay. And, and so patients see their data as it gets in there. They see my notes. They see our interactions. Uh, and we have that relationship that I was hoping to create. Um, there's a little bit of an example of what the video conference looks like. Um, again, seamless charting. As I'm doing the video consult, I'm actually charting in their chart and documenting what we're doing bringing links in to, to, to information or content or recipes that I want them to see. Um, all of my patients have a credit card on file in Hello Health. And so not only is it a virtual consultation, but it's also virtual immediate reimbursement. Um, and so I bill for email visits, I bill for video conference visits, uh, and it's part of our business model. Uh, we also use a lot of social media. Uh, we use Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest because we want to keep building on those relationships. We're not going to see all these people long term. I don't want to see them long term because they should be getting better. But we want to continue to touch them and feed them and, and give them the content as we learn new things or, or emphasize the things that we've already worked on. So we do a lot in, in social media. Uh, we've done events where we've rented out theaters just like this and shown movies to our patients uh, and patient population and, and new potential patients uh, and you know, had really, really fun times uh, connecting with them. So how do we scale this? How do we actually go out and, and do this for the masses um, and, and, and actually you know, start to change the game, as James said, and, start and, and keep winning and, and, and go beyond this? Um, so I started to think about that and, and you know, look at where we're headed. Um, look what we've done with food and giant you know, uh, malls and, and big box stores that have everything you can do and, and they've kind of wiped out a lot of the mom and pop and small businesses. Um, and you know, now we have big insurance. And so we're moving toward big medicine. You know, the holistic crowd doesn't seem to be as employed as the non-holistic crowd, but, but certainly there's been a mass exodus out of private practice and into giant hospitals. So we're, we're creating big medicine. And the answer is, well, let's create medical homes. You know, and I think some of the principles of that make sense to me, but it's just a new twist on disease-based care. So I want to create different medical homes, and I want to use this model. So we've got big food, but I don't shop at grocery stores anymore. I shop at local farms. 
I, I shop, you know, I go to the farmer's houses and I pick up what I need because, they, they, you know, they, they do it in small batches. They do it the right way. And I shop at farmer's markets. So let's create a medical home. Heirloom, organic, micro practices that are focused on empowerment. Okay? Heirloom, getting back to the roots, the roots of medicine, kind of like Hippocrates, right? The whole food is medicine thing. Organic, let's grow it naturally, let's do it the right way, let's do it how we want to do it and not have that be dictated. Small practices, low overhead, don't charge exorbitant rates and be able to reach the masses and empowerment, we already know what that's about and we're already doing that. Here's a map two years ago of farmer's markets in this country. Wouldn't this be awesome if this were the integrative clinics throughout the country and just kept spreading? Um, and it probably is a, a much richer map uh, two years later. What are we afraid of? You know, I do a lot of physician uh, uh, consulting and, and, and I guess counseling at some level too, um, and there's just a lot of fear. I, you know, I'm, I'm scared that I'm going to fail financially. Uh, I'm scared that I'm going to get in trouble with all the regulations. Um, I really fear talking to my patients about money and accepting money from my patients. Um, and I'm really worried that my community just isn't going to get it. And I'm going to have to, you know, teach people from scratch what, what this whole thing is about. Um, and, and so I, I think those are real fears um, and very, very justifiable fears. Here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of being an employee. I'm afraid of my creativity being suppressed. And I'm afraid of having my relationships dictated by outside forces. Th this is what I was in. This is what most of us have been in or are in. And this is what I'm afraid of. Okay? It's a natural fear. All of these fears are legitimate, okay? but we can work past them. Um, we're all high achievers. We, we got to where we are because we aced lots of tests and dominated in school and college and medical school. So we tend to be a little bit more risk averse. Um, and the system is really intimidating. And we're told that over and over and over again, which is why going and working for the hospital seems really attractive for a lot of us. Um, but demand for this is, is at an all-time high and just continues to grow. People want this. They, they want to hear you speak. They want to hear your message. They want to hear your story. And they want to go see you in the office. Um, and guess what? The conventional model is helping move people that direction rapidly. Um, and high deductible insurance plans, HSAs, and the like becoming more and more popular is making patients make cash value-based decisions. They know how to do that. They do it all the time on Amazon or the mall or buying a car. They just haven't had to do it in medicine, but they're doing it now. Um, I had a guy I saw last week who, who saw a cardiologist a month ago. And he came in, he had spent, he saw the cardiologist for eight minutes, and the cardiologist said, everything looks good, your cholesterol's great, we'll see you next year. His out-of-pocket cost for that eight-minute visit was $2,200. We did a, a, a much more in-depth panel, homocysteine, CRP, lipid, you know, different lipid profile markers, spent an hour reviewing that, talking about what it meant, and giving him the, the, the tools that he needed to reverse it for 25% of that cost, including the labs. Because now you can go out in the market and get cash labs, and people can stay off the grid there and, and get ridiculously low rates compared to what they're paying out of pocket. And so it actually is cheaper to see us in the short term and the long term. Okay? We've got HIPAA and ICD-10 and Meaningful Use and all these other acronyms that are really confusing and, gosh, I don't know if I can do that. Th these are all intended to push us into hospital-employed practice so that we stay out of that. Let somebody else do it. But I'll tell you, you don't need to worry about a lot of that regulation when you get off the grid. Your practice can look a lot like a lemonade stand. This is my daughter who's the CEO. My son is the chief of marketing. And my practice functions a lot like a lemonade stand. I have a product that's unique that patients desire. And I've presented that in public speaking and, and, and all of the online content. And they're willing to pay for really high quality stuff. And if you get off the grid, the regulation 
almost goes away because most of the regulations are based on billing insurance or billing Medicare or Medicaid. We're all cost and money blind. We don't know what we're worth. We've been told what we're worth, and if you actually calculate the work you're doing and what you're getting paid for, you'll be pretty shocked at what your hourly wage is. You need to figure out what you're worth and then build your business model based on that and get back to feeling good about your practice and feeling good about what you're doing. Um, be fair. Be open and honest with patients. I have conversations with patients all the time. I don't understand why you don't take insurance. Here's why I don't take insurance. Because your insurance company is happy to pay for your surgery and your testing and, and all the imaging studies that you had done, but they're not happy to pay for things that actually impact your health. Oh, oh, I, I get it. You know, and, and now we don't do any marketing. I don't do any speaking you know, outside of a couple random events because all of the patients that have seen us are marketing for us. We see a patient goes away satisfied the next week. We know that their coworkers, their friends, and their family, they're going to call the next week because they start to understand why we're doing what we're doing and that the value is, is significant. It takes a story, and it takes a lot of passion. And that's all you need. And so you need to start building things off of that. What about they just won't get it? Okay, I started this practice in the middle of a recession in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Let me tell you about Fort Wayne, Indiana. Men's Health Magazine <laughs> put out the results of Is Your City Stupid? And Fort Wayne was dead last. The USA Today was looking for signs of intelligent life in Fort Wayne. Okay. I've been in practice for four years. I haven't worked more than three days in the clinic a week. I haven't worked a Friday in, in four years. I pick my kids up from school two or three days a week. I'm doing better than I did as a primary care doctor. And we did this in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So guess what? You can do it too. Start small. Okay? Maybe you start a day a week. Maybe you start a Saturday morning. But start small with something that you think is really cool, that you think is a good offering for patients, and you think is fair and see how people interact with that. And then go out and talk about it. Go out and, and, and you gotta be yourself and craft that story and, and tell people all about it and get them excited about what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> the best way to predict the future is to create it. And Jeff Glad is creating it right there. This is not rich people medicine. This is people. This is medicine for everyone. There's a couple seats here down the front. We've got a couple left. So, um, Dr. Moreno, welcome. Good to have you. Okay. Let me just say one more thing on that that Jeff Jeff mentioned this afternoon. Jeff, so I interviewed Jeff this afternoon for the Evolution of Medicine Summit, which is coming in September. 2014. It's going to be the world's biggest medical conference, and we're organizing it. And you guys are all invited. It's going to be epic. I've got the most unbelievable lineup of speakers. In fact, I just confirmed today, Dr. Jeff Bland is going to give the keynote address. And Jeff, I know you're watching on the video, so tweet me a question later. Um, all right. By the way, his book, The Disease Delusion, is so awesome. Um, I, I went to this event last Friday, uh, last Wednesday. I was looking at it. And I was on the train on the subway home, engrossed in it. And this lady here, Jennifer, I'll just introduce her. Welcome. She just said, "Hey, what's that book about? Like, what's uh, what's it about?" And you know, it's a great it's a great uh, marketing thing to look because the disease delusion is is a punchy title, uh, but it's really I think it's really important. So, getting back to what Gleg, um, uh, Jeff just said. How do we get patients to market this cash pay model out, right? You need to engage your patients as your marketing tools. What they need to have in your office is a remarkable experience. Because the word remarkable means that someone had such a great experience that they remarked to a bunch of other people about it. That's what remarkable is. And it's so easy to deliver a remarkable experience in integrated medicine because if you just sit and listen, for 15 minutes, you're already delivering a remarkable experience. How many of you doctors here 
when you moved to an integrated model and you spent more than 15 minutes with people, had to get the Kleenex going for almost every visit. You start asking questions, someone listens to them for the first time. This is a remarkable experience and it's so easy to deliver. And so I'm really excited to say, look, this is the starting point. You just get it going. Jeff's done some really innovative stuff with showing movies. Who's seen um, Escape Fire, the movie? I've seen that like four times. There should be every hand up in this room. Escape Fire, it's on iTunes for 99 cents. You can, uh, you can rent it. I have yet to meet one person who's watched that film and afterwards hasn't been like, dang, I think I need to see an integrated physician or a functional physician. It's that powerful. Movies have the ability to change emotion and, and get people to do things. Escape Fire, check it out, it's epic. Escape Fire, F-I-R-E. I don't know, is that funny? It's my best gag of the night, just spelling. <laughs> All right, um, I want to introduce uh, the, uh, my next guest here today. So look, we're putting together a bunch of uh, doctors who are, who are taking medicine forward, and we're going to have to have a little clinical piece, because we're going to have Dr. Mark Hyman later. Let's have a big round of applause for Mark Hyman and everything that he's doing. But if you just add one E, you get Dr. Andy Heyman, and um, he's, a, he's a, a great physician, and... and this is, so Dr. Heyman is on the, on, on the start right, right now of delivering uh, the first board certification in integrative and metabolic medicine. So you could be board certified in integrative medicine in the same way that you could be pediatrics or cardiology. That's part of the evolution of medicine. He's pioneering that with uh, George Washington University. And why I'm so excited that he's pioneering that is because I met Andy Heyman through energetics. And most of you guys know that up until about seven days ago, I was the manager for energetics in the Northeast, and I've, um, I've done my last piece with that. And I just want to honor a couple of people who are in the room right now who made a massive difference to my life, and I probably wouldn't be here if I wasn't them. Sheila Reed and Lauren Stone in the background there. They were the first two clients that I met with energetics. They both recovered their kids from autism. They have an amazing story, and that story, they were the first two, first two clients I met. Imagine that as your starting point for starting a career in a whole new world. I was an investment banker before this, right? And then I, and I meet those two. You provided a lot of inspiration for me to keep going when I was a commissioned sales rep living in New Haven, Connecticut. It was not easy, and I really appreciate what you have. But coming to functional medicine from that end, from the more holistic end with energetics, really helps me to see that functional medicine is just the starting point, right? Systems biology is obviously something that we're going to have to understand to solve chronic disease. But what I think Dr. Heyman brings with his functional medicine background, but also an understanding of Chinese medicine and homotoxicology, is the next level of holism. There's another level beyond systems biology. There's another level of interdependence in systems. And what I came to, I really wanted Dr. Heyman to speak today. So one, you can see that we have a great man who's building the first integrative um, and metabolic medicine board certification for doctors, but also that there's another level of holism beyond functional medicine. And part of the goal of the functional forum is to start to bring that out. You remember Larry Polevsky talking about germs as bioregulatory mechanism? You remember Kelly Brogan talking about the, you know, the, the, the pathways associated with mental health? We're looking to just blur the edges outwards a little bit. And so I've got Dr. Andy Heyman to talk to here about the truth, the science, the real thing that's happening in the stress response. So, Dr. Andy Heyman. I am looking for freedom. So I just want to thank um, James and the group for inviting me. This has been really exciting to meet everybody. So how many people are practitioners in, in the audience? Almost everyone. Um, my job is to go from sort of the, the broader sense of where's the field, where's the practice, and now we're going to take a dive into the body. And I want to do it through uh, the stress response because I think it begins to really encapsulate um, some of these ideas that we're talking about. And in my perspective, um, integrative doesn't just mean integrating various therapies. It means integrating data, integrating knowledge, understanding that the body is this sort of interconnected unit. And it actually reflects back to my training from many, many years ago. I was 17 years old when I went through my traditional Chinese medicine training. I was trained um, with, by many instructors from Japan and China. And I was introduced to a, a very authentic Eastern-style education. 
And one of the interesting things about these older uh, knowledge bases, these older ways of healing, is that they automatically begin with this place in that there's a holism to us, there's an interconnectedness to us. And I think medicine has sort of lost that idea along the way, but it's starting to reclaim it. And so I want to talk about where I think medicine is going through the lens of stress, because I think it represents not only sort of um, this notion of interconnectedness, but I'm also going to challenge at the same time um, some deeply held beliefs even within the integrative community. Because I think it's time if we're going to step up to the plate and act like the big boys, we really need to be better, I think, with the data that we have. So this is a quote from uh, a very famous uh, neuroimmunologist. His name is Fouad Lachine. And he really represents, I think, in some ways, the future of medicine. He's talking about that interconnectedness. And in fact, what he's reflecting are new terms that you're going to be finding in the literature. Metabolomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, on top of genomics. And so this is, this is what he writes. He says, a human being is much more than the sum of blood, bone, and viscera. In the same way, each fragment of truth in itself is a lie. Therefore, the accumulation of unintegrated scientific facts does not protect us against ignorance. In the measure that we interrelate a greater number of fragments, the closer we can come to truth, although truth as an absolute is unattainable. And what he was talking about and what his research really focused on was how deeply connected the brain is to the rest of the body and how in particular it talks to the immune system, it talks to the cardiac system, it talks to the gut, and he, had, he made so many major breakthroughs that he was nominated for the Nobel Prize in 2001. So in some ways, this is the future of sort of biological medicine. But is this enough? Is this all we need to know? Is it the things that we can measure and touch and create sort of an objective set of knowledge around? And so I began thinking about my other training, the other way of being in the world, the other way of knowing. And so this is a quote from Richard Seltzer, who was a very famous surgeon poet. And it is a remarkable moment in time, really, where he's describing doing rounds with the personal physician of the Dalai Lama, who came to Mass General many, many, many years ago. And he's watching this physician do rounds in the hospital. And he writes, his eyes are closed as he feels for the pulse. In a moment, he's found the spot. And for the next half hour, he remains thus, suspended above the patient like some exotic golden bird with folded wings, holding the pulse of the woman beneath his fingers, cradling her hand in his. All the power of the man seems to be drawn down into this one purpose. And I know that I, who have palpated 100,000 pulses, have not felt a single one. I mean, how powerful is that? It's this sense that all of the emotionality and power of his being is brought to bear in the single moment. How many of us as practitioners really achieve that state, that complete openness to the person sitting across from us? It's not based on objective knowledge, measurable data, and yet this is also part of the human experience. This is also part of our reality as well. It might not be measurable in the traditional sense, but we all know it's real. We're all here because we have an instinct for this. And the question is, how do we blend the two? How do we honor the old ways and the observation that the body was this interconnected unit like a garden or an ecosystem that when one part changes, other parts change? and yet at the same time delve deeper and deeper and deeper into the measurable units that reflect this interconnectedness. My thought is that if we're going to be really good and we represent the future of medicine, we need to be able to contextualize these relationships, to make them integrated, to understand and measure how these movements occur from one part of the body to the next, how when one piece reacts to a pressure or stress that other pieces react to. And so this is the sort of blending of knowledge bases that I think will represent the future of medicine, that the metabolomics of the world will overlay with these other ways of knowing. 
And we need to be able to reconcile both. So how do we do that? And I really struggled with this idea because my job was to talk about something that's going on inside of us. And I wanted to do it in a way where I will be challenging sort of the status quo of conventional medicine. In fact, that's part of my job as the new program director at George Washington University, where we're establishing a new curriculum that's designed to do just that, to be able to push the field of medicine forward, but in a very acceptable and academic way. And yet at the same time, we needed to not only accept what we know in terms of functional medicine, but also be appropriately critical. And that the only way we'll move forward as a field is to do both at the same time. And I thought that this topic of stress, I think, is really important. And the reason why is because, quite frankly, medicine has failed when it comes to the topic of stress. We rarely talk about it. We often dismiss it with our patients. And and we have very few clinical tools to address it. We don't measure it. We don't really understand it. And certainly when I was in medical school, um, sure, it was sort of a throwaway topic. But we didn't have anything um, relevant to bring to the clinical table. On the other hand, I think from the integrative and the alternative and the functional world, we talk about it all the time. We're, in fact, sort of obsessed with it. And you know whether it's sort of um, speaking about Tai Chi and Qigong and breath work or um, better sleep or exercise um, or, or even sort of this topic of what's called adrenal fatigue, which is sort of our nomenclature for talking about stress. And we say, oh, your poor little adrenals, they, you've blown them out. They don't work anymore. And when you really look at the stress literature, though, there's not a lot of evidence for adrenal fatigue in particular. And there's a reason why this concept hasn't been integrated into conventional medicine. Because on the one hand, we've done a very good job at sort of articulating the stress response and measuring it, especially through, through saliva cortisol. But we've done a terrible job at really understanding how we damage the stress response. And in fact, the answers come from integrative physiology looking at how the various parts of the body connect with each other and how that ultimately leads to a stress response that's not working properly. So one of my favorite researchers is Bruce McEwen. He's a uh, physiological psychologist out of uh, Rockefeller University, and he's done quite a bit of seminal work on the topic. Unfortunately, much of it hasn't been um, sort of published in the conventional medical literature. It's more in the physiological psychology literature. And he talks about allostasis, which is the body's ability to absorb a stress and come back to center. And also allostatic load, which is the measure of that stress. And if we have too much load, our body breaks down and our psyche breaks down. And all of that is mediated by who we are and our individual differences, our perception of stress, our behavioral responses of how we manage and cope with that stress. And it loads through our physiology. And we see these changes, these body-based changes that can occur over time. And if there's too much allostatic load, the body literally begins to break down and, in fact, dissolve. That's what happens. And so the ancients knew this. The ancients understood that stress mattered, that our vitality mattered, that our energy mattered. And they developed a whole set of approaches and techniques and therapies to deal with it. This is a gentleman in Shanghai doing Tai Chi, which is a movement meditation. And this is some of the other work by Bruce McEwen that says what goes on inside of the body, though? What's happening when we have a stressor? So here are repeated stressors where the body absorbs a load and then comes back to center. That's normal. Over time, though, our body begins to break down. And in fact, the stress response goes quiet. It goes flat. But how does that happen? It really doesn't occur through ultimately the underfunctioning of the adrenal glands. It's a much more elegant and interesting process that ultimately leads to a whole new set of thinking and a whole new set of therapeutic decision making. So if you look at this model, we have the central nervous system in the brain. We have our adrenal glands that produce cortisol. Cortisol, of course, is our stress hormone. And then we have the immune system. This is the integrated unit that represents our stress response. And then there are, of course, other connections that occur throughout the rest of our physiology. But this is the central feature. 
So what happens is we experience a stress and our body makes cortisol. And there's a few important relationships to understand. As cortisol levels go up, our immune system is suppressed. We see a decrease in IL-6 and TNF-alpha, and we actually shift to what's called a Th2 dominant state, which is an allergic type state. So when people are under stress, they tend to get more hives and allergies and asthma. At the same time, there's a direct feedback loop to the brain. And this is the most important part. It turns out that there are key centers of the brain that respond to high levels of cortisol, including the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, the locus ceruleus, but in particular, the hippocampus. And this poor little hippocampus doesn't get enough attention. It turns out that the hippocampus has the most cortisol receptors of any area of the brain. And the way to think about it is that it's the circuit breaker for the entire stress response. Its purpose outside of its integration in the stress response is to provide uh, the context of memory and to integrate memories into our psyche, meaning that it gives memories purpose and meaning. It actually drives the emotionality around memories. It tells us which memories are important and which aren't. And it makes sense. If you're being chased by a lion, you want to remember that but you also want to know that that was important. And that's why the hippocampus plays a direct role where it actually sends its dendrites right into the hypothalamus. And if we have too much stress, we see the hippocampus start to swell under functional MRI studies. It becomes inflamed and excited and enlarged. And eventually, though, if we have too much cortisol, it begins to shrink and shrivel and die. And what happens as a result is the brain recognizes this. It recognizes functional and architectural changes in the hippocampus, and it starts to go into self-defense mode. And it says, I'm going to turn down the stress response to protect the rest of the CPU. And that's how we begin to see lower and lower output of cortisol and a diminished stress response in general. The brain is protecting itself against the ravages of stress. Cortisol dissolves the brain, it dissolves muscle tissue, it dissolves, it dissolves the lining of the digestive tract, it dissolves heart tissue, and the brain knows this. So the main feature of a stress response that's changing is here in the brain, and in particular this hippocampus. So we have excitation and neurodegeneration, and what happens though is the body goes quiet and it loses its ability to physically respond to stress, we see lower and lower and lower cortisol output. And as a result, we lose the break on the immune system and we see systemic inflammation, higher levels of IL-6, higher levels of TNF-alpha. And the body goes from an allergic state into a Th1 state, which is more autoimmune. It's more cancerous. It's more aggressive. So the fatigue that people feel from a low cortisol state, we're not even really sure, is it from low cortisol or is it from an unregulated, unregulated immune system that's now out of control? And the body and the brain is on fire as a result. And so this is what it looks like if you measure a cortisol response in a patient. So this is a saliva sample of one of my patients. And it really should be high in the morning and lower throughout the rest of the day. And instead, it's gone completely flat and low. And we know in a number of research studies that the flatter the curve, the sicker the patient. And what it really indicates is not just, oh, my adrenals are under-functioning, but much more importantly, likely damage to the brain, changes in the immune system, and architectural changes throughout the rest of the body. There are other ways that people get into this state too. We see changes in cortisol receptors, and in fact, sometimes we see this because the body actually on purpose raises the immune system to deal with immune threats. So one of the common states that I see patients in when they present with this and they say they're tired and they're inflamed, they don't feel well, they have an infection. And this is the last ditch effort that the body will try and do to contain that infection. It actually on purpose turns down the stress response. And how many patients have you seen in your practice where your cortisol levels are low they're achy and inflamed, and they say, I have brain fog and fatigue. And you say, oh, you have adrenal fatigue. Your poor little adrenals.
but you didn't test for an infection, did you? And so the body will do this on purpose, either to protect the brain or upregulate the immune system, but there are consequences to this. And so what this does, though, is it liberates our thinking to say, it's not just about raising cortisol anymore. It's about understanding all of these interrelated relationships that are likely occurring behind the scenes. So low cortisol, or technically hypocortisolism, may be an adaptive mechanism to protect the nervous system. That it's important and healthy for the body to do this. And so what happens in particular, we see what are called NMDA receptors, which are the hyperexcitable receptors in the brain. They start shivering and shaking and um, calcium influxes into the cells, and that's when we see the damage. But is there a repair mechanism? We used to think there wasn't. Fuad Lachine said there was, and others like him said there were. And it's called adult neurogenesis. It means that the brain has the ability to repair itself. So adult neurogenesis refers to the production of new neurons in an adult brain. And this is a mechanism by which we see these early stem cells and progenitor cells begin to insert themselves into what's called the CA3 region in the hippocampus and actually regrow new nerve cells in the brain. But how do you protect a brain that's on fire? What do you do? It's the breathing techniques and the acupuncture and the exercise and the lifestyle changes. But there are new breakthroughs. There are other ways to deal with this as well, which I think really blends the old and the new. It's very advanced work. It represents some incredible um, medical knowledge that is drawn from the old, but it also reflects the new. So there's a new product called RG3, and I don't, I don't have any relationships to these products, by the way. And it's not the quarterback RG3. It turns out that RG3 is part of ginseng. It's called a ginsenicide. And in ginseng, you have the RB line, you have the RG line, and there's RB1 and RB2 and RB3 and RG1 and RG2 and RG3. And it turns out that RG3 in particular is particularly effective at protecting the brain and inducing adult neurogenesis. And so it's a saponin, essentially. It's a derivative of ginseng. And it supports healthy neurotransmitter function in the brain. It decreases the excitotoxic and oxidative stress effects, or rusting in the brain, from neuronal cell damage and leading to enhanced memory effects. And decreases both microglial activation, which is the inflammatory response in the brain, and neuronal cell death which is associated with neurodegenerative diseases. And in fact, um, as part of a research product project, we're looking at using RG3 in uh, veterans that are coming back from active combat who are experiencing uh, traumatic brain injury and PTSD, because when you image their brains, they're all damaged. And the question is, how do you get it back? This is the million dollar question. This is the billion dollar question in medicine. It's how do you repair the brain? Because so many diseases start and end in the brain, and we just don't have a lot of tools for this. But RG3 is one of them. So where else do I use it? RG3 I've used in uh, Corvette Racing. I take care of the Corvette Racing team. And so this is Le Mans, which we won in 2011. And my drivers, they get out of their car after they drive for four hours, and they spray RG3 up their nose. And what it does is it allows them to be more um, calm in the face of stress, but more competent and, and more precise in their, um, in their driving skills. So here we are at Le Mans. And um, so the dosing is five milligrams twice a day if you're doing oral, but you can still have it compounded into a nasal spray. Another really fascinating and interesting product that also helps to repair the brain is called nicotinamide riboside. It raises a very special molecule called NAD in the brain, which is literally brain food. And so it's actually a B vitamin derivative. This is a very new innovation right now. And under heavy, heavy research, there's an extraordinary research group out of Harvard that's done a lot of uh, work on NAD. And what they're showing is if you raise NAD in the brain, you literally turn back the aging clock. They show absolute repair and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, uh, especially in both mouse models and human models. And so NAD is sort of the it molecule right now when it comes to neuroimmunology. 
And it turns out that nicotinamide raises NAD in the brain. And so you can take it orally, 250 to 500 milligrams a day, uh, but you can also do it as a nasal spray. So what I typically do is I have it just compounded by a pharmacy in Texas, and I combine RG3 and nicotinamide. So in my PTSD patients, my Alzheimer's patients, my chronic stress patients, uh, my Lyme patients, um, this has been a fabulous, fabulous tool to begin that central nervous system repair process. And so, what, so the point of this is to say, if you have a patient that's stressed and they have a low cortisol curve and they're inflamed and achy, your clinical target, in my mind, if you follow the literature and the way the body's responding to stress, is you deal with the brain. And that, to me, has been a real revelation and a, and a, and a breakthrough. But it all comes from accepting and understanding sort of this integrative physiology model of how the body changes over time under states of stress. So in conclusion, the stress system is tightly integrated with the nervous system and the immune system. A flattened cortisol curve may be an adaptive mechanism, uh, despite metabolic and clinical implications. And the clinical strategy to mitigate stress would be seek primary causative factors, behavior and lifestyle interventions, appropriate selection of natural products and medications, and then protect the brain. And what I really want to leave you with today is that medicine is changing rapidly, and we want to be in the middle of it. To do that, we need to be very sophisticated, very savvy. We need to understand and accept where the whole field is going in terms of metabolomics and proteomics and transcriptomics. But it turns out we still have something to say that is so important, and there are certain basic truths with our patients. And the body is the body no matter what, and the old observations are still incredibly important. And what we're looking to do is to develop a model of medicine that, yes, delves deeper into how the body functions, but is more wellness-oriented, it's more predictive, it's more preventive, and it's absolutely more personalized. And that, leads, that road leads right back to what we do as practitioners. And I think if we're open to all of these changes that are occurring, we'll absolutely be on the leading edge. Thank you. All right, so we've had a little bit of practical, a little bit of uh, clinical, and now we're going to bring the house down with the next generation of what's going to happen. So, man, we've done three functional forums, and I, I sort of gave you a, a little uh, clue last time. Um, you know, I've been trying to connect with Dr. Mark Hyman for a, for a while because he's obviously doing so much to move this forward. Jeff Glad spoke about there are factors outside of your practice that are moving patients towards doing these kind of, to seeing doctors like you. And Dr. Mark Hyman is at the forefront of that. And I'm so glad I, you know, I mentioned in the last time I had to uh, drive Dr. Hyman's car to LaGuardia and pick him up in order to have enough time to convince him to do this. So, as I said, the things that I do for this forum, unbelievable. Um, but uh, it's so great to have him here. So, not just all the cool stuff that he's doing online, and not just all the stuff that he's doing for the Institute for Functional Medicine, but who remembers the film with Al Gore called An Inconvenient Truth? Who remembers what sort of a difference that made to the world and to people understanding what's going on with climate change, or at least being aware of it, Tomorrow, in LA, is the premiere of a new film called Fed Up, and we have the trailer for you coming up right now, and then we'll have Dr. Mark Hyman. The epidemic here is worse than previously estimated, much worse. The message that's been pushed on us it's your fault, you're fat. Shouldn't be so hard to get them to run around and play, right? They have voracious appetites and they don't exercise enough. It's about how active our kids are. Forget about it. There are 600,000 food items in America. 80% of them have added sugar. Your brain lights up with sugar just like it does with cocaine or heroin. You're going to become an addict. You end up with one of the great public health epidemics of our time. This is the first generation of American children expected to lead shorter lives than their parents. I am 12 years old and my doctors have said that I am a statistic. We're blaming willpower and it's a crime. 
Over 95% of all Americans will be overweight or obese in two decades. We're toast as a country. The sugar industry is extraordinarily powerful. They're in business to make money, not to keep America healthy. What if our whole approach to this epidemic has been dead wrong? The government is subsidizing the obesity epidemic. We place private profit ahead of public health. Systematic political failure. By 2050, one out of every three Americans will have diabetes. Those diseases are being driven by sugar. This is the fundamental problem nobody's talking about in society. We could cure 80% of the problem where they prepare the food in the school. Tomato paste is a vegetable? Really? Junk food companies are acting very much like tobacco companies did 30 years ago. I would reject entirely any argument that they are in any way harmful. Lying through their teeth. Kids are being told the biggest lie they will ever hear in their lives. Ronald McDonald never sells to children. He informs and inspires through magic and fun. If a foreign nation were doing that to our children, we would defend our families years from now, we're going to say, I can't believe we let them get away with that. You have to change the diet of America. It's all preventable. Woo! Let's hear it. It's going to be epic. Yeah, so um, Bill Clinton's looking a little bit healthier than he was a few years ago, and uh, in the spirit of what we say here at the functional forum we got to stop acting like we're losing and start acting like we're winning and the one doctor that's doing that more than anyone dr mark hyman hey everybody you guys are brave to practice all day and come out at night and listen to talks that's pretty good so we're we're at a transition point a serious transition point. I've been doing this for over two decades, and I see many of you in the audience I recognize have been doing this for a long time. And I want to share with you a vision of what the future might look like, because we're at the precipice of that. And we don't have to be apologetic anymore for what we're doing, because we're doing the type of medicine that will be the future of healthcare. A couple of years ago at uh, Davos, I met Toby Cosgrove, who invited me for dinner with a group of people that included the head of IDO, the CTO of Microsoft, some really extraordinary people. And I wasn't sure why he asked me for dinner, because like, I, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm not exactly a, you know, at that level. So uh, I began to realize what he was doing. He was wanting to explore bringing functional medicine into Cleveland Clinic. And for two years he's been chasing me to try to get me to come to Cleveland. Now, there's no way I'm moving to Cleveland. <laughs> but, uh, but we've been in conversation. I said, okay, what do you want? And they really got that he was interested in looking at innovation that was going to change the way we practice and deliver healthcare. And that he saw what was happening in the field of functional medicine and the things that we were doing and realized that that's where the future was. And I said, Toby, you don't want me there. Because if I go there, I'm going to be very disruptive. I'm going to tell you that most of what you're doing is wrong, that in fact you're harming people, that I would want to implement programs that are going to empty out half your hospitals and clear out most of your procedure rooms, and that are going to reduce hospital visits and hospital stays and doctor's visits dramatically. Are you okay with that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what if I told you we could cut your angioplasties and bypasses in half? Would you be okay with that? Because that's where you guys make your money. He goes, I know, you're right. but." Medicine's going in a different direction. And I think they're motivated in part by doing the right thing. And they're also motivated in part by looking ahead and seeing what's happening with how reimbursement's going to shift to be accountable for outcomes instead of volume. So the amazing story is that despite my tremendous resistance and my continual efforts to convince him why it was a really bad idea to have me there, we are going to start a functional medicine institute at the Cleveland Clinic in September. And we are, and my criteria for doing it was to do it right. So we're going to put millions and millions of dollars behind this of the Cleveland Clinic's money, which has never been done before to help this field. We're going to create a clinical program where we want to bring in best practices from around the world. We want to create innovation summits where we bring in some of the top thinkers, including some of you in this room, for summits where we download what are the best practices 
for the conditions that we treat? What is the best thinking out there? What is the best treatments available, the best diagnostics? How do we begin to create practice guidelines and clinical programs that are scalable and can be taught around the country? And then how do we build an educational curriculum for undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate education? IFM is for postgraduate education, but we want to get all the way down through. They just started a medical school there, and they're partnering with Case Western, and they are very interested in innovating in education. And we're going to create a clinical research program where we're going to test this model and go head to head with conventional care and show them for autoimmune disease, for diabetes, for migraines, for asthma, for the whole list of issues that we treat people for successfully. We want to show that this works better than conventional care. So you're going to hear more about this over time and those of you who come to the uh, Functional Medicine Conference in San Francisco, who's going there in the uh, in the sun. It's going to be fantastic. It's sold out. For those of you who want to go, I'm sorry. There's no more tickets. I can't even get a, barely a ticket. Uh, it's, it's actually quite amazing. Each year, we hold these conferences. We expand what we're doing. So we went from, you know, 400 to 600 to 800 to 1,000 to 1,200. Now we're at 1,500, and we keep getting bigger venues, and they keep selling out months in advance. You think it's like a, it's like a playoff game or something in the NBA. You can't get a seat. And people are emailing me and begging me to, to help them, and I don't have any pull. So it's, it's really astounding to me to see the interest that's happening and the, and the change that's happening in medicine right now. And to have somebody like Cleveland Clinic, Clinic who is really one of the leaders in, in, in healthcare, who's looked to as um, an institution that is really at the forefront of change, and to have them come to us for help, that's a statement of where we're at. So I don't think we need to be apologetic anymore. We don't need to apologize for what we're doing or be on the outskirts. We are at the center of the change that's happening. You're all at the center of the change that's happening. So I'd like to um, share with you a, a little bit about how I believe we can really create transformation in health. And it, my thinking has changed over the last few decades. Um, this movie speaks to a really important problem. And I encourage you, for those of you who are in New York, it's, it's um, starting Friday at the Angelica Theater in New York City. It's the only place it's showing. So I encourage you all to go, bring 10 people, go on the weekend and watch this movie, because it, it really is a, a tipping point in our thinking about naming the problem, which is the food industry and how they've created products that promote disease, the diseases that we're all treating in our clinics. So it's like we're standing at the bottom of a waterfall trying to mop up the floor while the waterfall keeps gushing at us and pouring disease-producing products into the marketplace that are affecting our patients. And the, um, the thing that needs to happen is, is not just changing the way we practice, and that's important, but it is, is changing the whole upstream cause of this problem. You know, I was at the World um, Economic Forum in Davos, and I gave a talk, a couple of talks, and I was at this initial meeting, and there was all the powerful players in healthcare in the room. There was a few hundred people and they had a panel of the head of Sanofi and the head of Aetna and the head of this and the head of that. And some guy from Harvard School of Public Health was moderating. And it was you know, a very impressive panel. And they were talking about how, how do we deal with the crisis in healthcare. And they talked about how we improve efficiencies in healthcare delivery, how we reduce medical errors, how we improve health IT, how we coordinate care better, how we deal with care management and chronic disease management. And it was you know, this discussion of what I felt was like moving the deck chairs around the Titanic. And I, and and I, and afterward, and all those changes are necessary, but they're not sufficient to create the change we need. And I got up at the end, and I said something which I thought was completely obvious. I said, you know, all these things you're saying are great and need to be done, but have you ever thought about what we need to do to prevent the fact that there's going to be forty-seven trillion dollars spent? on treating chronic disease over the next 20 years globally, $47 trillion. That's more money than the GDP of the six largest company, uh, countries combined, right? It's an enormous, I don't even know what a trillion, I can't even write a trillion. I don't know how many zeros that is. <laughs> That's why I'm a doctor, not, a, not, a, not doing anything else. I can't do math. So uh, the, the, the question I said was, if how do we prevent those patients from going into the system in the first place? How do we deal with the cause of the problem upstream and not get the people in the system. And they were like dumbfounded, like it was the most brilliant question that had ever been asked at the World Economic Forum. 
And afterwards, the, uh, the head guy who was running the panel came up and said, Mark, that was such a great question. And we hadn't thought of that. <laughs> and, and we all discussed it in our closed meetings and how great an idea that was. And I'm like, you're kidding me. You guys are running the ship here. <laughs> so um, that's what we need to do. And I, I, um, you know, I, I've been doing functional medicine for a few decades. And I got into it because I was sick. I had chronic fatigue syndrome. I had mercury poisoning living in China. Breathing the air, and uh, and I have you know all sorts of I had all sorts of issues that happened, and I developed um, you know I was riding my bike 100 miles a day, and you know fit as I'd ever been, and I went from functioning at a level where I could see 30 patients, remember every person, not take a note and dictate their chart at the end of the day without any notes, to not being able to walk up the stairs, to not being able to remember where I was at the end of the sentence where I started, I couldn't read my story stories to my kids out loud. And, and actually understand it at the same time. I could read out loud, but I couldn't actually understand what I was saying. That's how bad my brain was. It was like I had ADD, depression, and dementia all at once. And I had abnormal autoimmune antibodies. I had elevated CPK levels of 600. I had abnormal liver function tests. I had low white count. I had all these bizarre things. My gut wasn't working. I had rashes, sores on my tongue when I'd eat foods. I, I just was a mess. And I had to sort of struggle to figure out what was going on. And I was working Kenya Ranch at the time, and one of the nutritionists said, you know, Mark, you should go meet this guy, Jeffrey Bland. I'm like, okay, God, fine. So we went to this conference, you know, like 1996, I think. And I heard him speak, and I said, are this guy's a genius or a lunatic? <laughs> and if he's right, then I owe it to myself and my patients to figure it out. So I began to try it on myself, like many of you probably have. And I started training my patients, and they would get better. And I would say, you know, eat this, take this, do this, and call me in three weeks. And they would call me back and say, my migraines are gone. I'm like, they are? <laughs> <laughs> they say, my autoimmune disease is gone. I said, it is? <laughs> and you know, I, I didn't believe it because it was so out of the realm of what I learned to actually be true or effective. So I spent, you know, the last 20 years, you know, working intensively to refine my understanding of functional medicine and and to help push the field forward through the institute or the textbook and with, with our certification program and you know, build the, the infrastructure and the model of the matrix, which is understanding the body as a, as a set, of, uh, as an ecosystem, as a system. And, and that it's a system comprised of intersecting biological networks, we call the matrix, that are influenced by our genes and the environment that create imbalance in these, in these components in, our, in, the no, in these nodes in our network. And that what we do as clinicians really needs to be understanding these dynamic systems and how to play with them, how to work with them, how to remove the things that are causing impediments to the, well, uh, to the, to the optimal functioning of these systems and to add in the things that are, are going to help our organism thrive. And it really comes down to a very simple process, which is understanding the, the biological networks and the matrix and removing the things that cause impediments, which are toxins, allergens, microbes, stress, and poor diet. And adding in the things that create thriving, which are the real food and nutrients and right balance of hormones, air, water, light, movement, rest, rhythm, connection, community, love, meaning, and purpose. Those are all the ingredients for creating a healthy human. And so in my practice every day, that's what we do. And we see you know, extraordinary results. And there's still pockets where we're stuck, you know, where I think you know, Lyme disease is one of them. And there's some others that are challenging for us. But I think for the most part, we do way better for most of the chronic conditions that we're suf suffering from in the society than anything else out there. But I recognized that wasn't sufficient and that, uh, you know, that people were living in environments that were promoting disease. So I went, w uh, you know, I, I want to talk about this model, which I call the 4C model of, of health transformation, because we can't just practice medicine. We have to think health is bigger than that. Health doesn't happen in the doctor's office. Health happens in our kitchens. Health happens where we live. It happens where we work, where we learn, where we pray, where we play. That's where health happens. It doesn't happen in the doctor's office. There's 5,786 hours in a year, and if you don't believe me, you can count them. And, uh, and uh, you know, how many of those do you spend in the doctor's office? You know, maybe a few. And what happens to the other 5,700 and some odd hours? It's where you're living. And so, I realize we need to expand our definition of what we need to do to create health. And I think as physicians, we, we think kind of narrowly as just our practices. But we need to really begin to think uh, of ourselves as 
as healthcare providers in a broader sense. So the first C of this 4C model is the content of care. What is it? That, what is the intel inside? What is the DNA? What is driving the biggest change in biology? Right? How do we drive the biggest change to create health? What is the science of creating health? And I believe that's functional medicine. And it's evolving, it's changing, it's improving, and we're going to continue to refine the model. And that's why I'm excited to partner with the Cleveland Clinic because it gives us a, a way to leverage and accelerate that process. So that's the first C. The second C is connections. And the connections I'm talking about are the connections between human beings that create change. So I began to think about this when I went to Haiti after the earthquake. And you know, I, like many of you, I watched on TV and I saw what happened and I was sort of dumbfounded and, and felt helpless and had the urge to go. But you know, I had no way to go, so I you know, didn't know what to do, but I realized I wanted to go. And uh, unlike many of you, many of my patients are billionaires. <laughs> and one of them emailed me with a subject line, want to go to Haiti, and he had his own Gulfstream 5. So he said, get a team together. So we lo got a team, we loaded the plane up with gear, and we went to Haiti. And we were the first people on the ground. I brought Paul Farmer with us, and uh, we were in the trenches. And then I got to know Paul Farmer, who, for those of you who don't know him, he's modern-day Albert Schweitzer. He's really an extraordinary guy. Partners in Health is an organization that's changed the face of TB and AIDS in developing countries and how we treat them and as a model for the Clinton Foundation and the Gates Foundation. And what he discovered was something very simple. He said, the solution to TB and AIDS is not better medication or better surgery or better medical care. The solution to TB and AIDS is each other is this simple notion of accompaniment, that we have to accompany each other to health. So he created community health workers, peers, people helping people, going to each other's homes, making sure they had clean water, food to eat, that they had their medication to take at the right time. And he proved that that worked better than anything else. And then I began to think, wait a minute, this doesn't work just for infectious disease, it works for chronic disease. In fact, chronic disease is also contagious. That you're more likely to be overweight if your friend's friend is overweight than if your parents are overweight. Even if your friend's friend friend is overweight who you've never met, you're more likely to be overweight. That our social connections and our social threads are more important than the genetic threads that connect us to our, our medical fate. And I recognize that if disease was contagious, that maybe also health was contagious. And so one day as I'm sort of chewing on this, and I, I read a book called Turning the World Upside Down about uh, the way in which the, the first world could learn from the developing world about how to solve our healthcare problems by the use of, of communities. And he said, Nigel Crisp, who's the f father, um, and the head of the National Health Service in, in, in the United Kingdom said, we need to turn healthcare upside down and put patients and communities at the center of healthcare, not doctors and hospitals. And so I, um, I began thinking about this and I didn't know what to do. And then one, guy that, one day this guy walks in my office, this really overweight guy who was Rick Warren, who was a pastor from a church in Southern California, who you know, gave the, one of the uh, invocations at Obama's first inauguration. And I'd heard of him. He wrote The Purpose Driven Life, which sold more books than anything other than the Bible, nonfiction. And uh, so I took care of him, and I, he wanted to lose weight. And I said, hey, why don't we go for dinner after? So we went for dinner. I said, so tell me what you do. Because, you know, I'm a Jewish doctor from New York. I don't know much about Christian churches in Southern California. So I said, you know, what do you do? So we've got 30,000 people. I'm like, wow. He goes, yeah, we meet every week in 5,000 small groups. And I thought, well, this isn't a mega church. These are thousands of mini churches. And the light bulb went on my head. I said, Rick, why don't we create a healthy living program the church and see what happens. He goes, great, because you know I was baptizing my church the other week, and after about the 800th person, I'm like, man, we're a fat church, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a fat guy, and you know I just lifted 160,000 pounds. <laughs> so um, we created this program based on this idea that people helping each other could change our behavior, that the connections that we have with each other are the very thing that's going to change how we live, how we eat, how we exercise, our stress levels, all the things that really matter when it comes to changing our health. 
And in, we thought a few hundred people would sign up. First week, 15,000 people signed up after our first rally. They lost a quarter of a million pounds in the first year. And this has continued today. In fact, on Sunday, I'm going to Atlanta to meet with all the black pastors in Atlanta to bring this into the churches in the South. And um, we wrote a book called The Daniel Plan, which came out last fall. It's a, um, it was the number one New York Times bestseller. And uh, I wanted to call it The Jewish Doctor's Guide for Christian Wellness. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I couldn't really get that on the cover as a subtitle, but um, but it's quite extraordinary. And you know, you've got a Jewish doctor, a Muslim doctor, and a Christian doctor working with a pastor doing cooking classes on the podium, or the whatever you call it on stage. And um, you know, it was it was phenomenal. I I got up and you know when we had this big rally to launch the book, I said, you know, if Jesus came to dinner, what would you feed him? I said, would you feed him a Big Mac fries and a Coke? I said, if you believe God lives in you, why are you feeding him crap? <laughs> you know, and I said, it's really simple. I said, the, the message is really simple. Leave the food that man made and eat the food that God made. So, uh, you know, I wrote this book. We wrote a cookbook and a curriculum we had a, and a program for churches and campaign for the pastors. So we've kind of made it goof-proof step-by-step for the churches to scale this and for synagogues and for whoever wants to do this. So I think... You know, it made me realize that the power of social networks is really the power of change. You know, I, I did a, a, pro a program for my 10-day detox diet, and it's really dealing with the biology of sugar addiction. And we had a group of 600 people do it, and we created a Facebook, private Facebook page online. Am I talking too long? No. Okay, because I'm a, James. Am I, okay, good. I got a couple more minutes, and I'll, and uh, <laughs> I'm not talking too long. <laughs> I think. I know, I, I, I got it. I'm, I'm on my way there. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of meandering to the seas. <laughs> so uh, we're on the second sea. We're good. Um, so, um, wait, where was I now? Okay, so we did, this, we did this online Facebook page, and we had 600 people do this program. And they lost 4,000 pounds in 10 days and 2 inches off their waist and their blood sugar dropped 20 points and their blood pressure 10 points and their MSQ, the medical symptom score, dropped an average of 62% in 10 days, which is phenomenal. That's an average of 600 people. But what struck me was that we had this Facebook page and in 10 days there were 1,500 pages of Facebook interactions and comments and connections. That people were desperate for connection. They were desperate to support and help each other, encourage each other. And I wasn't even doing it. I wasn't like, I wasn't even in the picture. You know, in the church, we had three doctors providing our content, but we weren't running these groups. We just provided some of the content. So I realized that the power of each other and the power of social connections and the power of social networks is really the key to changing our behavior. So to change biology, you need the first C, which is functional medicine and bi power to change biological networks. And to change behavior, you need the second C, which is connections, or the power of social networks. The third C that I see is really the change that we need is community. And what I mean by community is the environment in which we live. And unless we change the environment that we live in, it's hard to change. You know, in this movie, Fed Up, you know, there's a, a family that, that um, I went down to, to see. And... Um, they were, they were very overweight um, and very sick. The father was 42 on dialysis, renal failure from diabetes. The mother was massively overweight. The 16-year-old son was massively overweight, pre-diabetic, 60% body fat. He wanted to know. He said, uh, can I get to 100% body fat? I said, no, you can't, but <laughs> don't worry. And, um, and, and we, we looked at all their blood work. I went with them, and I said, you know, um, they lived in Easley, South Carolina, which has a, a, a restaurant, it was called a Retail Environment Food Index, it's something called the Retail Environment Food Index, which is um, how many fast food and convenience stores there are to produce markets or grocery stores. And there it's one of the worst ratios in the country, 10 to 1. They live in a food desert. And, um, and, I, and they lived on disability and food stamps. And I said, you know, I don't need to give you a drug or tell you what to to take, but let me go to your house with you. Let's let's cook together. Let's make a meal together. Let me show you how to cook a simple meal. 
So I'm on the environmental working uh, board uh, group. Uh, I'm on the board of the environmental working group called, uh, which created a guide called Good Food on a Tight Budget. It's been a long day. I've been on CNN and this and that. And so, oh yeah, I'm on CNN right now. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it's my stunt double. <laughs> um, actually, I am. It is, it's on right now. Um, so, so can you just play it so I don't have to talk anymore? <laughs> so uh, so uh, anyway, I... I um, I went to their a trailer and I said, let's cook a meal. And I, I gave them my cookbook, a blood sugar solution cookbook. I gave them this good food on a tight budget, which is how to eat food that's good for you, good for the planet, and good for your wallet. And I cooked with them. They didn't have knives and cutting boards. I had, we had to cut sweet potatoes with a butter knife on a plate. And uh, they didn't know how to peel garlic. They didn't know how to cook a vegetable. They didn't, I mean, nothing. Like they had, and I, took, I showed them what they were doing. They had no idea. And I... Um, and I, and I showed them how to cook a meal. And they did it. And the mother's lost 100 pounds. The father lost 45 pounds, was able to get a new kidney because he needed to lose 40 to get a new kidney. The son lost 40, but then he went to work at Bojangles because the only place to get jobs there is in the fast food industry. So he was in a toxic food environment, and he gained the weight back. And it's sad, and, and we're going to help him, but it just it sort of exemplifies the issue of the environment that you live in and how it determines your behavior. If you're in a food desert or you're in an area where your friends are all doing things that are harmful to them or where you're in a work environment where there's candy in every drawer, where you're in schools where 50% of the schools in this country have fast food in the schools, Pizza Hut, Domino's, Burger King, McDonald's, literally serve their products in the schools by brand name. You know, how can you be healthy if the environment you live in is toxic? And, and Dan Butner wrote a book called The Blue Zones and he's created an initiative around creating healthy communities. So he went into a little town in Albert Lee, Minnesota, and he said, you know, let's not tell people what to eat or exercise or anything. Let's just create an environment where it's easy to do the right thing. So let's change what's at the checkout counters at grocery stores. Let's give people 10-inch plates instead of 12-inch plates. Let's let kids not eat in the hallways or the classrooms, only in the cafeteria. Just by doing that, they had a 10% reduction in weight in these kids simply by changing the way their environment was structured. They built walking paths. They had grandmothers, that they created an initiative where they had grandmothers walk the kids to the school bus. So they started walking more. And they just had simple interventions that dramatically reduced the healthcare costs in that community and improved the health of that community simply by changing the environment in the community. We did that at the Daniel Plan. The church changed what was in the refineries, changed the menus, changed the grocery stores, changed what they were providing in their grocery stores and how they were labeling the foods. The restaurants started changing what was on the menu. That's you know happening in places like New York where you can get gluten-free food and you can do all sorts of things, but it doesn't happen um, in most places. We need to change the community. And there's a lot of initiatives that are happening around that. The, the fourth C, and I'll let you all go home, the fourth C is this idea of connectivity, which is how do we use technology to help make these things available to everybody, to make it easy to do the right thing, to get the support that you need. And th there's a whole quantified self movement, which is ways to track your biology and get interactions. People are using the Fitbit or Jawbone, and they're, they're comparing with each other. They're doing it in communities. They're, they're s doing it through social connections. And they're, they're getting feedback. So we know people tracking their results makes a huge difference. And the digital platforms to do that are important. And there's going to be more and more of that. Um, I'm working on an app right now with a company that is headed by this woman who was the former VP of Commerce for Google, Google and people from Apple and Kaiser. And they're creating a very interesting app, which is a digital coach, a coach in your pocket, essentially, where they're creating an app that, where you can interact with live coaches. So if you're in the healthcare system and you're a doctor, you have someone who has a um, you know, rotator cuff injury, well, you send them to the physical therapist, right? But if you have someone who has a lifestyle injury like diabetes, where do you send them? There's nowhere to send them to. So you can you know, refer them into... Um, uh, a system where there's coaching and support and, and help to, to sort of fill that gap in healthcare. So it's, it's really like use of the technology to sort of bridge some of these gaps. And I think with really looking at health in the bigger space, the content, the, the connections, the community, and the connectivity, we can begin to see how we can shift the whole model of, of what's happening. And when I say even the community, I mean the policies. You know, in Mexico, for example, they had a dramatic increase in diabetes and obesity as their soda consumption increased, which is now 20% of their calories. And they was crippling the country. And they, they looked around the world at what were the interventions that made a difference to change the health 
of their citizens. And they found there were a number of key things they found and they implemented them. And even Michael Bloomberg, who I saw last night, helped, helped them implement some of these issues. One is the soda tax. Two was ending food marketing. Three was getting rid of anything that wasn't helpful for kids in schools. And four was food labeling that made sense as opposed to the labels we have now that even if you have a PhD in nutrition, you can't understand, right? Green, eat it. Yellow, caution. Red, eat at your own risk. Simple, right? Like, you know, now you have a pack of cigarettes that says, you know, if you eat this, it'll drink, smoke this, it'll kill you. Your coach should say, if you drink this, it'll kill you. And then you know, right? So I, th I think we need to begin to think in those broad strokes where we work at all these levels, the biology, the community, the connectivity, and the, and the connections between people. And I think with those broader frames, we can begin to shift health of America. And we all have to do all these things in our life all the time. I work at all these levels because I think we, we each have to do it in whatever small way we can, whether it's in our schools, in our workplaces, in our offices, we can make these changes and begin to be models for the healthcare that has to happen in the future, which all of you are part of. So I hope you help me and I hope we all just do this together and we hope to take back our health together. Thank you very much. Hey, thank, thanks so much, Dr. Hyman, Dr. Heyman, um, Dr. Glad, and Eric today. We've gone a little bit over our time, but I just want to say a couple things. So Dr. He Dr. Hyman spoke about connectivity, and you can see that Dr. Glad has set up a model for that, and this is working in the poorest zip codes. Dr. Hy Dr. Hyman also set me up because he said the one thing that we weren't doing that good a job of is Lyme disease. And guess what? Next month's functional forum is all on. It's all going to be on Lyme disease. We're going to have leaders in the field of doing all the innovative types of strategies that are really working. Um, and uh, I look forward to sharing with you that. Normally we have questions from Twitter at the end. We've gone a little bit over. We will be across the road in the Ainsworth. The Ainsworth is just across the road to the left. Um, feel free to come and join us over there for a drink. Thank you so much. This has been the Functional Forum, the future of medicine. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. <laughs>